Russian natural resources were only brought under control in 2004. Before that, the resources were not even under Russian jurisdiction. The law was abolished only in 2004. If we hadn't done that, we would have never depended on the oil prices. All Russian laws were written on the back of foreign grants. I didn't know that before the head of the Duma committee made the statement. The key laws. In our country, we had... It was the Americans who had written our laws for us, including oil. We just accepted oil under the standard law for developing states, the colonial law, well, for the countries of the third world. It is important here to understand the following. I said that in 2003 we made the decision to fight. The initial decisions had been overridden, and the oil revenue started flowing into Russia from the 1st of January 2004. That's what's important. Before then, we would receive less than 20 cents from every petrodollar, and no one would say a word about it. In the 1990s, Russia saw a period of exchange on the part of the then leaders. It was the exchange of the political support of the elites. Not only America alone, to a great extent he also needed regional support. The agreement with regions was achieved on the basis of special tax regimes. This is about Tatarstan, Bashkiria and Yakutia. I'm not talking about Chechnya. Igushetia was managing fine without the agreement. Tatarstan and Bashkiria are also all about the oil. What was the price that we had to pay for the product sharing agreement? One man, there was one man, Vladimir Putin, managed to change the situation profoundly. What is the product sharing agreement? Why was Russia losing its own oil and its oil income? It seems that some of the major constituents of our budget is oil, gas and arms sales. This is an unexpected conversation that we are having today. It is literally a conversation about the fact that we do not know that man at all well. We don't know what he does. And that man's name is Vladimir Putin. The losses amounted to two-thirds of the overall budget. Russia started fighting for it in the year 2000. Our country? Yes. And we achieved victory officially in 2004. Does that mean that the struggle began only after Putin came to power? Yes, of course. Before that, all oil and natural resources, according to the product sharing agreement, were not under Russian jurisdiction. They did not belong to Russia, and there was a special law regulating that. The budget losses made up two-thirds of the budget itself. All pensions were three times as low as they are now. The entirety of state spending was three times as low as it is now. The oil revenues were being stored abroad. That money did not manifest itself in the Russian economy. It became the property and the spoils of foreign states. That money was not Russian. So you're saying that Russia had not been getting a single cent from its own oil business for more than ten years? Right. It was getting nearly nothing from its oil because the product sharing agreement was in effect. When you said that a year ago, everybody was shocked. For some reason, they didn't know that the oil, which Russia is so proud of, hadn't been supporting Russia before Putin. I have a very important question for you. How is our budget developed? Yes, of course. And who was stealing all that money during those years? Someone must have been stealing it, it seems, and what did Putin do about it? And if, and this is my question, it is a fundamental aspect, then why us? Why Russia? To this day we know nothing about this business of Vladimir Putin, and we still know nothing about that role of his. People didn't understand that politics affected their lives as much as their families did. It is based on the living standard and on the security level of the country. If all the oil and the revenues from it were being kept abroad, then we're talking about tens of billions of dollars, perhaps hundreds of billions. And there was only one man who took those risks, and it was Putin. He was taking risks internationally in the wake of this, and so many people were unhappy about it. Unhappy about those risks which have already taken place. This is what we are going to talk about. Firstly, no one has abolished the word propaganda, but the focus of propaganda is aimed against us. They do not understand that the Russian state was established by American advisers. You have already said that the Russian laws have been written on the back of American grants, and that they were economic laws. The state structure of Russia was created by foreign advisers. Tens of thousands of people were working in our ministries and departments, establishing Russian statesmanship there. They were working in all sorts of ministries. 
I saw it with my own eyes. I even brought it to President Putin's attention. Soros's sponsored support and made exercise books for our children, ruled notebooks, that sort of thing. Was there a scandal with textbooks, which Soros had published and approved? Yes. It was ideological manipulation and sabotage, when you could see they had three lines about the Battle of Stalingrad and four pages about the link-up on the Elbe. This is a different kind of story altogether. It was just a notebook for school children, but there was no text of the national anthem on the back cover of those notebooks. There was no multiplication table there either. Why would American presidents be printed on Russian notebooks for Russian children? It wasn't just one notebook, there were hundreds and thousands of them. Was Putin surprised? Yes, he was. He really was. Because it was like, here, this is how politics goes. How was it that Russian oil had found itself completely abroad? What is the product sharing agreement? Let's not hastily explain it using the example of Sakhalin. Sakhalin is the last remaining agreement. 260 agreements have been abolished. They were approved according to the president's orders on the basis of the law, which had been passed before Putin came to power during the 1990s. So it includes all Russia's oil, all gas, all metals, everything. 262 deposits were made on this purely colonial scheme. Scheme, and all the money from the Russian raw materials was supposed to be wired abroad. In other words, we have lost everything. No metals, no gas, no oil, and all the money was sent over there. There is a deposit, but it is not under Russian jurisdiction. It doesn't exist, that's it. It has been cut out of Russia, this deposit, and has been moved to somewhere else. I can honestly say I knew nothing about it, about the oil. You served as the Vice Prime Minister and as a minister. Were you aware of all the trouble? We were in Saudi Arabia with a construction delegation. The Minister of Oil and Energy was with me. When we saw how they dispose of oil in Saudi Arabia, I asked him, who is in charge of oil sales here? He gave me the number of 169 different people and there were prominent comedians and singers among them. All of them run the oil business? Yes, they do. The minister was against the whole thing, but the list of those people was growing and growing. Oil would be bargained away at a time when oil prices were at a minimum. When Putin was advancing towards the presidency, I was saying that we would have to regulate all that in this country, starting with oil and gas prices and finishing with the state organization. That was an enormous job, of course. Most importantly, why did Boris Yeltsin make such decisions? He didn't have any other way out. All these things are interconnected and aren't studied in Russia. There would have been no Yeltsin as a figure without international support. From Russia, they took the nation's major advantages, oil and gas, and they paid nothing for it, nothing at all. We have not received anything yet, although we have been extracting oil for several years already. If they increase their spending, we will not be getting anything for the next 10 years. Look at the extra costs. The cost of legal services has been doubled, the cost of foreign personnel has been almost doubled and the costs on business trips have been increased by two and a half times. The spending included the cost of apartments for employees in the town of South Sakhalinsk, which were overvalued by 40 times. It also included plane tickets, weekend charter flights with goals in Seoul, and even a concert of a brass band in Krasakov. We paid for everything with our oil. In product sharing agreements, when foreign companies like the British company Shell come to our shelves, we don't go 50-50 with them. They take the oil to cover their expenses. If they were to have something left over afterwards, they would give that to us. They would include everything in their expenses, things that they were and weren't allowed to do. Our country's budget increased by three to four times after the law had been abolished. It increased only because we terminated the product sharing agreement. Why do I think that Putin is not just the president? He is actually the leader of the national revolution, 
because he personally risked everything. Let's have a proper look at that. Did he put his life at risk? Of course he did. It's not too difficult for any foreign secret service to kill the president of another country. Gaydar Aliyevich Aliyev told us reporters the story of how they in Azerbaijan foiled an attempt on Putin's life. We didn't want to advertise ourselves, so we didn't say anything about it. The FSB knows that. Before Putin arrived here, they knew that we had already taken some measures to conduct the operation. This year saw Azerbaijan's National Security Ministry's most intensive work. This man is an Iraqi national named Kenan Ahmed Rustam, but is also known under the aliases of Abdul Rahman Bukhari, Abdul Sayyid Al Kurdi, and Kenan Dastam in the terrorist underworld. He was trained in Afghanistan and in Chechnya. So the Iraqi has Chechen links. He was trained in Afghanistan and then waged war with the Chechens. It is hard to say when exactly they started plotting Putin's assassination. He had a whole arsenal of explosive devices. There was a complicated system of bombs, which our specialists had not seen before amongst common self-made bombs. How are they planning to kill the Russian president? The bombs were cell phone controlled bombs. They could be programmed via a signal from, let's say, Baku, which meant that it was possible to detonate a bomb from the cellular network to the phone. And he wanted to assassinate Putin in Baku during his visit. Yes, this is the information that we had. They captured the man who was supposed to kill Vladimir Putin. He was arrested and is serving a life sentence on the outskirts of Baku. Did any reporters manage to find out anything? Did anybody go to that camp near Baku to find out any details of how he was going to kill Putin? We know nothing about it. Allegedly from Chechnya. You must understand that all of Chechnya and Dagestan, all these terrorist activities, are an entirely foreign project. Can you find one line in our newspapers which says that Putin was facing a real danger? Moreover, when we tried to show a quotation on the assassination from that report about Aliyev on one of our TV channels, we will not mention any names here, they cut the whole piece out. There was no such attempt on Putin's life. They just cut it out before airing the film. Berezovsky was saying that it was a matter of manipulated chaos in the country. I knew nothing about that number. When Putin liquidated all those agreements, the budget of the country increased from three to four times. Well, the collection of oil taxes after the Yukos case went up 80 times. Other companies started paying out as they should have done according to Russian law in the wake of the Yukos case, and it amounted to an increase of 80 times. They wanted to pay nothing to Russia or to any of our old entrepreneurs, like Khodorkovsky and his Yukos. Of course they didn't. As Khodorkovsky clearly wrote in his letters from the dead house, Russia is a territory for hunting. Why don't we know about all this? They are thieves and killers. Khodorkovsky had dozens of corpses under his belt, reportedly up to 72 people. Some people just vanished, their bodies have never been found. Like Svetlana Vragova, the people's artist from Russia. Khodorkovsky was trying to kill her and she was lucky to get away alive. 
In the beginning of the 1990s, Menatep was actively purchasing real estate in Moscow's Pokrovka and Kolpachny Ali. In Kolpachny Ali, several people were killed, but it is impossible to prove Menatep's affiliation with those deaths. The assassination of Alexander Konchatov and the story of Svetlana Vragova from the modern theatre, the expulsion of the youth initiative, the company for employing teenagers, are all impossible to connect with Menatep. But those guys are close to the Komsomol, and they somehow realized at once that Khodorkovsky simply needed that real estate, the area near Kolpachny Ali. The most interesting sign was the fact that they left enormous black footprints everywhere. Did Khodorkovsky admit later that it was them? He apologized afterwards. He admitted it and he said, for God's sake, I'm sorry, I didn't know it was you. In other words, Menatep acknowledged that it was them. Of course. What about the murder of the neighbor? He was Alexander Konchatov. Over there is Menatep Bank, and there is that building inside the yard. I lived in that building for 10 to 15 years. Everybody moved out, but not me. I was born and grew up in this area, in Chistia Prodi. They came to me and said, here, we can offer you to move to Yasa Nilva, and so on. I told them to leave me alone. They would listen and listen to me, and then realized that they would not be able to persuade me. I came home one day and saw men with rifles in front of my house. I looked up and saw that they had changed the windows. I opened the door, went in, and then it all happened. I took some photographs of it so you can see what it looked like. I believe a person can feel that kind of shock in Chechnya, when a bomb hits their house. When I entered the apartment, I saw that they had channeled the walls, taken the furniture out, taken my whole library of books. I believe a person can feel that kind of a shock in Chechnya when a bomb hits their house. When I entered the apartment, I saw that they had channeled the walls, took the furniture out, taken out my whole library of books. I have to say, I've never felt anything like that in my life. It's like a state of weightlessness, when you cannot understand where your feet are. You lose your sense of reality. We bought the camera, but the guards would not let us in with the camera. We don't know anything, they said. It's Ukrainian builders who opened the doors and stole everything. The most frightening thing about the whole story is that nobody wanted to help. I went to the police. There was that very fat policeman there, and he would scratch his belly like this. There was an old Mercedes car nearby, which he had most likely received as a gift. He just laughed at me. I was telling him that I had my apartment and now I had nothing, and how they had come and taken everything away. He just told me to go to court. I went to a lawyer, but he was just the same. You know, it was a feeling of complete estrangement. This is how Svetlana Vragova lost her apartment. Khodorkovsky took it away from her. He stole it. This is the sense of lawlessness which started to pick up speed during the 1990s. That was a time when some people believed that they could do anything. Let's get back to oil now. What about your book, What Khodorkovsky is in Jail For? We did an interview in 2005, didn't we? So it's now been five years. Has the book been republished? Why was Khodorkovsky jailed? What's he in there for? It has been published just once. The print run was 5,000 copies. It's not such a small print run after all. Врагова, вот она, Светлана Александра. Уголовное дело по факту. Квартиру украли у Враговой. Как хотелось расстрелить этот подъезд Минотеп, банк был во дворе. Дом забрать. Кто не хотел уезжать, того убивали. Врагова не хотел, ее ограбили. Хорошо нас умел найти каких там людей, которые Ходорковского знали. В криминальном мире, кстати говоря. В том мире, где могли повлиять. I was sitting in my study. It was about half past midnight. I had nowhere to go except for my country house, which I rent. I had no home, and so I called Konstantin Sherbakov. He served as the first deputy minister for culture. And he said to me, well, what can I do? I told him that I was sorry to bother him. I hung up, and then the phone rang all of a sudden. It was him again, and he told me that he had someone who could help. And then the story began. You need to call Alexander Sergeyevich on the cell phone, he said. I didn't know who that person was. I didn't have a cell phone either. I ran to some businessmen, they gave me a cell phone, and then I called this man. He said, hello. I said, this is Vragova speaking. He said to me, the friends of my friends are friends, and he hung up. When I came to the theater, Menatep started calling immediately. This is how Khodorkovsky came to buy her an apartment. Other people were shot dead in the building. They just shot them dead. This is a crime story. You come home and you find that you have no home. Khodorkovsky admitted it himself. 
Does Vragova's story have enough for a criminal case? Vragova hasn't got a case. Why doesn't she have a case? Because during that period of time, money was more important than conscience and was more important than state power. Today we are discussing Putin, Putin's murderer. He is serving a life sentence. Anybody can interview him, but nobody is interested in doing so. The truth about Khodorkovsky is not interesting. Your book will not be republished. Why isn't it interesting for us? And oil, too. Now we know that tax collection has increased by 80 times after the Yukos case. This is a huge budget, and it was Putin who bought the oil back. It was all because of that hideous product-sharing agreement. Now let's get back to what has been happening in Sakhalin and how people were living there until Putin interfered. The budget of the country has increased three to four times, and we know nothing about it. Well, it appears that we can feel it. Why isn't that interesting? I think the people have become super saturated with information. The truth is no longer something which is true. The truth is what they claim to be true. A peculiar feature of a satisfied society is to show no interest whatsoever in the truth. They show more interest in the consumer market or in their own health. I wouldn't say that this is such a bad thing. Now let's get back to 2003. Sakhalin. What was happening there, and indeed, how were people living there, the Russian people? There is so much oil and so much gas there, but the people were living without heating. There is no hot water here. We haven't had any since 1980. But do you pay the bills? Of course we do. I don't live in my apartment because it's just not possible to live there. We've been living on Sakhalin without heating for four years now. We survive with heaters, but they cost a lot. We live only in one room. All other rooms are closed. I don't even remember a time when I could take off all my clothes. We have to wash ourselves too. I just feel as though I don't want to live anymore. That was filmed in 2003. In January of 2003, Sakhalin was freezing. We're standing here near a kindergarten. Children cannot stay in the building because it's only one degree above zero inside. My daughter goes to art school. We went there yesterday and it was just one degree inside. Children can't study there. They walk along the corridor and it's slippery. Sakhalin is freezing at a time when Shell and other companies take Russian oil from Sakhalin. The state began to regulate the foreign and the home markets, especially the oil sales. This is the same question about the price that Putin had to pay, and about how he managed to do all of that. Here is another excerpt from our program made in 2003. Sakhalin is freezing, but Russia owes a lot of money to America, and so the Americans simply take our oil according to the product sharing agreement. They take our oil, and we still have to pay them millions of dollars. This is an interesting question. It's good that somebody has finally asked this question. You have to read the terms of Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2 product sharing agreements, which apparently nobody has read before. Those were monstrous conditions for Russia. They were criminal, especially the terms of Sakhalin 2. How much is the Russian Federation losing out on in those agreements? Today, Russia is supposed to give away over $700 million to the Americans working on the continental plate. We are supposed to pay the Americans, whom we allowed to work on our shelf. We owe them to this very day. Is the country in the red? We're approximately $723 million in debt. For what? How can it be that it is our oil and they are making money on it? Explain this to me, I don't understand. What do we have to pay them nearly $1 billion for? Ramazan, I remember our old report very well. We showed the tragedy of the people who had to pay for heating that they didn't have. Adults and children were freezing in their homes. As we say here, only half of the town gets heating. The other half doesn't get any of it at all. They laid the pipes, but they were not insulated. So as you can see, there's no heat in apartments, nothing at all. They have heating on the first floor. Those living on the second floor have some too. And those living on the upper floors don't get anything. How warm is it inside the apartments? The temperature depends on electricity. Some pay their bills honestly, whilst others steal electricity because they just have to. Some people have three children in their families. Electricity is expensive, 1.70 rubles. People have to steal to survive. 
People were stealing to stay warm. American and other companies were mining and importing our oil within the terms of the Sakhalin II agreement. By 2004, Russia had to pay the Americans almost $1 billion because they were mining and importing our oil. That was the agreement. We give away our own product and then we pay them a billion. This is insane, but this was just how things were working out. That was the national tragedy indeed. Sakhalin was freezing. There were so many questions and the public were desperately looking for answers, but Yeltsin stayed silent. Even in occupied Iraq, there are people that realize that it's shameful to admit that we gave it all away under the product sharing agreement. Do you remember those statements? Russia is a poor country. Russia is incapable of doing anything. Russia has no technology. It will never have money. Russia's primary goal is to surrender and to sell itself. There was another idea which came from the vice chairman of the Yablaka party, which I was also a member of. He believed that in 10 years' time nobody would need oil anymore and that everything would be based on thermonuclear synthesis. So we had to sell oil as quickly as possible, under any conditions, otherwise nobody would buy it. Did Yavlinsky really believe in that? 49 years of my life gave me every reason to believe that even close to power, there aren't any idiots. As far as I can remember, when I was in the administration, I was working on Sakhalin too, and I believed it to be absolutely correct. We were attracting enormous resources, tens of billions. This country would never be able to attract our own Russian resources, not now, not then, and not ever. The most interesting thing here is that Viktor Chernomyrdin, who supported the whole debacle, has not changed his stance in spite of Vladimir Putin's statement. We haven't received anything as yet, although we have been mining oil for several years already. If foreign companies increase their spending, we will not be getting anything for the next 10 years. We can hear Putin speaking on the subject in his characteristic manner. He is calm as he says those words. The price was too high. He was ostracized from the whole Western world, save for Germany and France. For the returned oil? Yes, the whole Anglo-Saxon world, all seven sisters. They are Anglo-American companies because Britain had the strategic line to ensure oil security at Russia's expense. They were working on it very actively during the 1990s. Why do I call him the leader of the National Revolution? Because he stood up to the system. Inside the Russian Federation, he personally stood up to a system created by foreigners. The system of state power, the system of economy, administration, security. And he stood up against all that personally. He was the turning point in Russia's development. Russia began to evolve from a colonial into an independent state. What's next? The fight is next. So the fight is ahead of us? The fight for oil as well? Well, of course. You pointed out the key moment correctly. We were ordered not to know. Someone heard it and forgot about it. There was no serious discussion. I had a meeting with Obama during his election campaign. It was a month or two before the elections. What was Obama's position towards the Russian Federation? Everybody knew what it was. The Bush administration had underestimated Russia, and Obama was saying that Bush was wrong in his assessment of Russia. In other words, he underestimated Putin, Russia, and her potential. The funding of the mass media in Russia increased several times after Obama came to power. That's an interesting subject, Yevgeny. What do they get dollars for in Russia today, some of our colleagues included? They wage informational wars against those who try to save the country.